thank you for joining me this evening for Arkansas Valley's Audubon Society's program, Birding in Antarctica. I'm Megan Wilbar, Museum Coordinator for the InfoZone Museum at the Rawlings Library. And joining me this evening is Dr. Peg Rooney, President of the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society, and our presenter, wildlife biologist and President of the Black Canyon Audubon Society, Dr. Bruce Ackerman. Dr. Peg Rooney is the President of Arkansas Valley Audubon Society and is definitely the mastermind behind this series of programs. Um, it's a monthly program series and we thank you, Peg, for sharing your passion for the environment and love of birds um, to bring these programs to us. They're very valuable. Um, I'd also like to welcome Dr. Bruce Ackerman, who's joining us from Montrose, Colorado tonight. Um, Bruce was a wildlife biologist for 35 years. Um, he retired from the Idaho Department of Fish and Game after 12 years of employment in 2016. In his varied career, he did research on manatees, mountain lions, wild boar, and mule deer. He is currently trying something new, teaching a course of environmental science at the small Montrose campus of Colorado Mesa University. And Bruce has been a bird watcher for 40 years and has been president of three chapters of National Audubon Society and is the current president of the Black Canyon Audubon Society. Um, Bruce and Susan live outside of Montrose, Colorado and Western Colorado and can usually be found birding in Montrose or anywhere else in the world, as you'll see by tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, they retired to Western Colorado to enjoy bird watching, wildlife photography, hiking, rafting, downhill skiing, and most other outdoor recreation. Um, they enjoy world travel, and their most recent trip uh, was to Antarctica in March of this year, um, and is also the subject for tonight's program. So we really thank um, you both for being here this evening. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Peg, who will let us know a little bit more about the Audubon Society, and then we'll turn it over to Bruce. Um, thank you so much. Hi, I want to welcome you here tonight and ask you to take a stand for birds. Uh, every day, there's a new assault on the environment, on birds, on other wildlife, and their habitats. Uh, Science Magazine reported in 2019 that we've lost 3 billion birds since the 70s. And birds are an indicator of the health of the planet, so they're not doing very well. And neither are we. So one thing you can do to help is to join your local Audubon Society. And we, together, we can leverage our voices with millions of other people who care about birds and their habitats. So I encourage you to think about joining, and you can find membership information on our website, Southern Colorado Birds. So it's abbreviated SOCO, S-O-C-O, Birds, socobirds.org, socobirds.org. We hope you'll consider joining. And now I'll turn this over to Bruce. Hey, here I am, Bruce Ackerman, coming to you from Montrose, Colorado. I'm going to give you a slide talk that shows us going to Antarctica. So we went during last winter, just before all this COVID stuff happened. And now, up until a couple of days ago, it was hot over here. Now it's pretty cold. But um, let's see, I'll start my slideshow any second. And... Uh, I'm going to tell you that the weather down there in the summer, their summer is about the same as our winter. So that's good. It's pretty comfortable. So Megan, am I able to share my slides now? You're, you're good to share. Okay, so uh, Susan Werner is my wife. We went on a cruise ship. You go down to the very end of Argentina, get on a cruise ship, and go to different islands down there in the very southern end of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the last February and March. Here's pictures of us. Uh, of lots more, but with some penguins and some. Antarctic fur seals. So here's where we went. Uh, the very tip of An Argentina in South America and over to the Falkland Islands, 200 miles out in the ocean. 
to South Georgia is an island which is 800 miles from the mainland of South America. And then uh, to the Antarctica Peninsula. So Antarctica is sort of a circle with one peninsula that sticks up and it sticks up 500 miles. So it's quite a bit warmer. Then went back to Argentina. So here's another picture. It's sort of from a different angle. We flew from Montrose down to Buenos Aires, Argentina, the capital, down to the very tip of South America, got on our ship and made this big triangle. Well, the ocean down here is some of the roughest ocean water in anywhere. We had pretty good luck. Sometimes it's terrible, sometimes it's good. You never know. So we're 19 days on a ship, I'll show you that. Let's see, just some notes so I can remember. So what, uh, one of our favorite things to do is bird watching, and we really wanted to see as many kinds of penguins as we could see. We saw six species of penguins, from large to small. And they're really interesting because they live in different places. They nest in different ways. They have, some are on beaches, and some are on cliffs, and some are on ice, and some are down in burrows. Other kinds of birds that you could only see down there, we saw four kinds of albatrosses and 10 species of petrels, which is sort of like seagulls. Some gulls and skuas, which are also like seagulls, and some other birds in Argentina. So we saw about 75 kinds of birds, and almost all of them you could not see uh, north of the equator. We also saw five kinds of whales, five other kinds of dolphins, and six, six species of seals. So this is the town of Ushuaia. That's a Native American uh, name for this town, which is a shipping port at the very southern end of South America. It's got big mountains. Uh, it's got a national park. So if you live in Argentina, most of the country is hot, but people go um, to Ushuaia in the winter, let's see, in their winter is a ski resort, and in their summer, it's a, a cool place, like going to maybe Fairbanks, Alaska. So a small town right up against the mountains. Uh, this is a harbor, everybody's down along uh, the harbor, getting their picture taken. And because it's their summer, even though it's not very warm, and it's always windy, there's all town, so we got on our ship there. But first, we spent about three days being tourists, going around. Um, there's pretty good bird watching right in town along the, the harbor. And then we went to a national park for more bird watching, which we do every day, wherever we are. So this is a southern lapwing. This is a, a big shorebird. It's kind of like our killdeer, but even larger and noisier. It's a bunch of kinds of gulls. There's a kelp gull. This is a, a cool looking gull. It's called a dolphin gull. It's a bright red beak and legs and uh, striking eyes. There's a number of different kinds of waterfowl. They're all different, nothing the same as what you could see in North America. So this is a kelp gull. Kelp is a big seaweed. This is a, uh, an ocean going goose, a kelp goose. And it looks like it might be two different species. The, the male is all white and the female is all brown. So we. Uh, we were down there in Ushuaia, which is the end of the world. The sign says the end of the world. So you could drive from here to Ushuaia, but that's it. That's as far as the road goes. Uh, so the very tip of Argentina, southernmost town in the world. And so this is Susan. So we went with Susan and her brother, my brother-in-law, William. The sign says the people of Ushuaia welcome you. So 
this town is in Argentina. They speak Spanish. It's uh, Spanish. Their own pesos, their own money system, uh, their whole government. And um, but Ushuaia is kind of an outpost. Uh, maybe maybe like Fairbanks, Alaska, or something. It's definitely way out there, and it's too cold for farming. But there's a lot. It's a seaport. And a lot of commercial fishing down there. And it's actually, these are several islands. Uh, so you have to go across bridges to get this town. And this is uh, in Patagonia. It's a very southern and most remote part of Argentina. What else? Uh, Argentina has kind of been at war with the Falkland Islands for a couple hundred years. Uh, the Falkland. Argentina claims the Falklands. There's a mural in town. It says that the Falklands are and always will be Argentina's. Uh, if you go over to the Falklands, they don't agree with that. So we hired a bird watching guide and went to the uh, National Park. It's close to town. It's Tierra del Fuego National Park. It sort of reminded me of Glacier National Park in Montana. So there's Good sized mountains above timberline. There's big lakes, there's forest. It's uh, called the Southern Beach Forest. It's not like any forest in North America. But we did some good bird watching there, even though it rained all day. It's rainy and windy all day long. Uh, this is one of the birds we saw. It's a small hawk called a one of the kinds of caracara, several kinds of caracaras in South America. This is a chamango caracara. It's about the size of a raven. This is a grebe called a great grebe. We have different kinds in Colorado, but not like this one. This is pretty cool. Black necked swan. These are all birds that you can only see in the southern part of. South America. There's a different goose, an upland goose. There's a, a snipe, a large snipe called South American snipe. There's a duck called a red shoveler. I didn't take this picture, but I took most of them. Um, we never got close to these. So there's a shoveler duck in North America. Coloring is all different, but the uh, body builds the same. There's our ship. So we got on our ship in Ushuaia. This is not a picture I took of the of there. Um, it's hard to take a picture of your own ship. This is the island sky. It's a nice little cruise ship. So it only has 100 passengers. It's much smaller than most cruise ships. Um, it's 300 feet long. We went uh, with the expedition company named Polar Latitudes, specialized in Antarctic trips in uh, December to March, and northern trips like Norway in the uh, in our summer. So we we're on a ship for 19 days. We went on a big triangular route, and uh, one of the things to know is there are no docks down there for ships, hardly any. So uh, if you want to go somewhere, you got to figure it a different way. So we start out, we have a life, life, life jacket drill before we leave port. Well, it's a two-day trip across the ocean over to the uh, Falkland Islands. We had lectures several times a day. We had different social events, cocktail hours. We had a staff ornithologist, a British woman who studies penguins, telling us about the birds we would see in different places. Some of the pictures look kind of funny, like looks like this penguin's going to attack my brother-in-law. The Falkland Islands are really interesting. There's two big islands and about 700 little islands. There's only about 3,000 people who live there. So that's like 
much less than Montrose County. So we went to uh, two distant islands out on the west and one uh, to the main capital on the east. So there's only about 100 miles across. It's not very big. So we're 200 miles out in the uh, Atlantic. So Falkland Islands are British territory. So it's a self-governing small country. It's only 3,000 people. Uh, Argentina started a war with them in 1982, and I think both sides are still mad about it. Um, there's four kinds of penguins that nest on the island, and black-browed albatrosses and some other seabirds. So we got to visit some of those nesting places. Well, like I said, most places, there's no dock. So you, you pretty much need a small ship and then some rafts to get to shore. We go 10 people, a couple crew members in the Zodiac rafts. You could go anywhere in those. So uh, one of the islands we went to on the Falkland Islands, one of the smaller islands in this group, these are king penguins. They're nesting there. So these are about waist high. It's a pretty good sized penguin. They nest right here in this spot on the on the beach. We stay there about three, four months, and then they spend the rest of the year in the ocean. Never touch land again until next, uh, let's see, their, their spring, which is in about September. So these are babies. These are medium-sized babies, the little brown ones. So I think I have another picture of some bigger ones. They're just kind of funny looking, and they stand there, look at you. And so the babies stand right here for about five months until they're big enough and get their adult feathers. And then they're waterproof and they can go out to sea for six months at a time. So this is Magell Magellanic penguins. It's a different species. These are smaller, about knee high. So everything down there is named either after the explorer Magellan or the biologist uh, Charles Darwin or his crew in a ship. His ship was the Beagle. So a lot of things are named after the Beagle or one of those guys. So this is a Magellanic penguin named after Magellan. So these are molting. So at the time of year we were there, the uh, baby penguins are about all the way grown. The adults have about finished feeding the babies. So the adults mold all their feathers. So all their feathers fall out, not at once, but in a short time, and they grow new ones. So for a month, they're not waterproof. They can't go in the ocean. So for a month, they're just standing there, looking at each other, looking at us, looking at the babies. Nobody's getting to eat. Um, so this might look like snow, but there's feathers, they're white feathers going everywhere. When, when their feathers start coming out, they're such a tightly packed mass of feathers that when their feathers come out, they just, it looks like snowdrifts. These are Gentoo penguins, another small species, and it's one of the most common the species. They nest here on this beach. The Magellanic we just went saw, they nest in burrows in the ground. The others nest on the surface. Gen 2 penguins are cool looking. Here's some other waterfowl, the upland geese. So we saw some others on the mainlands. The ones in the Falkland Islands are a different species that are very similar. So we're going back and forth these islands in our little zodiac rafts. Went to another island. We hiked over this. Um, over this pass from one side of the island to the other. We all wear the red coats. They give them to us as like really heavy windbreaker because, I don't know, they don't want to lose us. That's it. They want to be able to find us and have us show up in their pictures. Um, so we hiked about a mile over this hill and went to see where the albatrosses nest. 
So this is rock slide. This is over a cliff and a rock slide. It's covered with penguin nests and albatross nests. So here's some of the nests. I'll show you some closer pictures just to get you oriented. So everything around there, there are no trees. There's just tall grass. I mean, the grass is waist high. So we were able to sneak up to the edge of this cliff and look over. What we're seeing is a black-browed albatross and their babies. So this is a nest. This is a baby. This is an adult. The adults feeding the babies. So these are birds that fly but never swim. They can land on the water and take off. These are penguins. This is a different species, fourth species of penguins. These are southern rockhopper penguins. So they can't fly, but they can dive, and they can climb up these cliffs where they have their nests. These are several nests of the black-browed albatrosses. They're getting big, but they still have another month to go before they can fly. So the Penguins and the albatross are all mixed together in these big rocks. Everybody's taking pictures because you can't believe how many good bird watching photographers were on this trip. This is an adult albatross coming to feed the baby. So the albatrosses, so this is one of the smaller kinds of albatrosses. Its wingspan is nine feet across. That's incredible. But there are other ones that are bigger. There's the adult flying in and um, going to feed the babies. And he has to land on these rocks somehow. This is the baby. Stays just on his little nest for about five months. So its, it's wings are grown in. They're about six feet across now. But... Um, it's growing their new primary feathers, so growing flight feathers for the first time. So it'll be nine feet across when these feathers come all the way in. So he's practicing flying. As the adult going out, uh, the adults fly hundreds of miles to catch fish off the surface of the ocean. Then we went to the capital of the Falklands, Stanley's the town. Uh, the whole economy is built around tourists, and commercial fishing for fish and squid. They have their own uh, British system. They have their own British pounds and British coins, British stamps. So we tour toured around the city of Stanley. Well, first thing we did was went on a nature trail. So I think I said there are no trees growing naturally. It's kind of like Scotland, maybe, northern Scotland. Very open, kind of heath, lots of uh, plants that we don't recognize. So how do you keep the people from wandering across uh, off the trail? I've never seen this before. We think that we've gotten all the landmines but we're not sure. So stay on the trail, report to us if you see any. That worked in my case. So we're looking down on this beach. There's nice beaches, but it's too cold for swimming, even in their summer. Um, these are the Magellanic penguins. Again, they're molting there, just hanging out uh, for a month, waiting till it's they're able to go back to feeding. Some other birds we saw, uh, we would call these birds cormorants, but the British people call them shags. So this, this species is rock shag, and they nest on sheer cliffs right along here. We saw thousands of them, and the kind of cormorant. This is the town of Stanley. It's only a few trees. It's pretty open. Pretty colorful in places. So our, our ship docked at that dock. There's a 
famous church, but this arch is made of whale bones. That's a scenic site. They have weddings and stuff. Well, so here's some other kinds of waterfowl. These are the steamer ducks. So this, this is a uh, species. There's one species in South America and a separate species on the Falkland Islands. They're, and they're flightless. They can't fly. Uh, they have little short wings. So this is a male. And it's a pretty big duck. And... But they can go. They can motor along the water with by uh, sort of paddling with their wing. There's a female in the lower left with little, little tiny wings. That's all the wings they have. They never fly. Female. Those. Uh, they're very cool looking. There's a oyster catcher. Kind of shorebird. This one also called Magellanic, and this one lives in South America. And there's another what species um, called the blackish, <clears throat> blackish oyster catcher. So now we're getting ready to go to South Georgia. So South Georgia is an island about 200 miles long. It's out in the absolute middle of the southern Atlantic Ocean. That's uh, 800 miles from shore, and we brought the ship in and went to several places along the um, east side of the island. And the reason is the west side is always stormy. You can't bring the ship in close enough. So South Georgia is named after King George the Third of England, who we got in a war with about that time. So South Georgia has some of the most abundant wildlife in the world. There's penguins, and seabirds, and seals, and whales by literally millions. There's always rough weather down there. There's almost no people live there. Um, cited in 1675. Captain Cook went there in 1775. It's just about before we had a war with England. So South Georgia is named for King George. As soon as I got there, they realized there's a lot of seals and whales down there. They started hunting the seals for their blubber and then hunting the whales for their blubber and meat and fertilizer. It's, uh, millions of seals and whales were killed for these purposes. So anyway, uh, we went down there. This is in not there yet, but it's showing the going around in the cold, icy water in the Zodiacs. We have to get on and off the boat. First of all, this is like the nicest, clearest, calmest day that we had. So getting in and out of the boat at the uh, back of the ship is sometimes hard, sometimes okay. And after we got off, so about 100 of us take turns to get on in these 10 of these rafts. And then when they're done, they have to hoist the rafts up to the top deck, so 10 stories up, so we can motor on to our next destination. That was pretty fun to watch all this. And this is a nice day, but there were some pretty darn rough days. Uh, this is a day with raining. It's me. would take your pictures all the time. I took 6,000 pictures. It's my wife, Susan, brother-in-law, William. We were pretty cold that day, rainy and windy. So South Georgia is famous for having some large penguin colonies that you can get to, that you can get to pretty easily. So that's good. It's a long way to go to get there, but when you get there, you can walk to these penguin colonies. So here's Susan. Uh, so it's, it's sort of like Norway, I think. There are fjords, there are cliffs and waterfalls and tall mountains with glaciers on them. So these are king penguins. Well, there's almost no vegetation. It's always cold. It's always wet. Sometimes the sun comes out, but 
it's kind of cold and wet and muddy all the time. And this is the warm season. So we all walked over from the boats, over this little hill, over here. We had to stay at least 15 feet away from the penguins. But they didn't have rules. They could come up right up to you if they wanted to. Sometimes they did. So this is a king penguin. It's about waist high. It's really pretty colored. Well, there were probably 14,000 penguins nesting in this one valley. So had our picture taken. Well, there are also seals all over the place. So this is where we landed the zodiacs. They literally had to clear a path among the penguins and seals to be able to land and walk across this beach. So these are the Antarctic fur seals. And they also come ashore and have their babies. The babies uh, stay on the beach for months until they're big enough to be uh, hunt for themselves out in the ocean. So some of the people paid extra to go kayaking. And I really wanted to do both kayaking and bird watching. But I didn't do both. But kayaking is pretty cool. A few people tipped over. The water's really cold. So the mountains are really pointed. There's glaciers on top of all of the mountains. Um, there's waterfalls and cliffs everywhere you look. This whole thing is just amazing. Penguins everywhere, and they're really noisy. They're kind of smelly, too, because they poop a lot. These are the fur seals. They, they claim the, the tall grass and have their babies wait for them up there. King penguins. Sometimes they come right up to you, look at you. So we all had to carry a ski pole to, to fend off if the penguins or the seals tried to come up and bite. They did sometimes come right up. And the uh, seal pups reminded me of like golden retrievers. They're like curious and big enough that they could nip you. Here's the king pup penguin molting at the end of the breeding season. Those feathers are just coming out like crazy then growing new feathers. Well, another day we went to the wandering albatross uh, colony. Well, we went to this island and we walked up this trail and we looked at these birds, but this is not my picture because uh, it was pouring the whole day that we did that. We saw them. So the wandering albatross as the, is the bird with the longest wingspan in the world. So it's 11 feet across. There's a picture of one flying along beside the ship. Our ship photographer took this. It is hard to take good pictures off the ship. But we saw these wandering albatrosses quite a bit. They're really cool. It's the longest wingspan in the world. Well, there are no permanent inhabitants anymore on South Georgia. There's a few ghost towns. This is the biggest ghost town of them. So this is a whaling headquarters for about 60 years. I hunted whales from here and brought them back to here, chopped them up, uh, boiled them down for oil. So when you're here, you are a long way from the rest of civilization. About 500 people lived here. And... Um, not all the buildings are still standing from 100 years ago. The little church is still standing. It's been uh, repaired. They have a British post office. Yay. This is the only gift shop for 500 miles. They have their own stamps. There are some coins, commemorative coins. You can buy stuff, hats and T-shirts. It's great. We only got to go to about three gift shops on the whole trip. 
a mailbox, a museum. So it's really interesting. All kinds of different um, memorabilia back from the back in the day. Well, that area is famous because Sir Ernest Shackleton is buried there. But he came through here on his one of his four po South Polar explorations. So he had a good plan, leave England, come down here, go to Antarctica, walk across Antarctica to the South Pole and to the other side, and the ship will pick him up on the other side. This is good, 1914 to 1917. They had sled dogs and sleds. They had what you'd call the first uh, snow cats, but not so good. They got stuck in the ice. Happened a lot. Got stuck in the ice, but then their ship sank. They took everything off the ship. They floated around on the ice for about six months. And then they they had some little rowboats. So they rowed over to another island called Elephant Island that we visited. And then six of them took the lifeboat and sailed over to South Georgia and got help. But it was tough. They managed to rescue everybody. This was tough going. Here's a picture of the little lifeboat. The six of them went 800 miles across the roughest ocean in the world. There's a replica of the uh, lifeboat at the museum. So here's where uh, Shackleton is buried. He died on another cruise a few years after that. He's buried here. This lady's a descendant of his. A lot of the people on the cruise were history buffs, really interested in the English explorers. We had people from all over the world, but a lot of people from England and Scotland and Wales. So you have to go there and toast to Sir, Sir Ernest Shackleton with Shackleton Scotch. We're going to leave in a little... A ghost town. So there's about 20 people who live here in the summer in the whole island and just and gone in the winter. That's the whole population. So we're bird watching. It's windy and rainy and rough and the ship's going up and down and the birds are going up and down. Sometimes it's kind of tough bird watching. There's another beach we went to, the king penguins, but these are elephant seals southern elephant seals so they're the deepest diving seals they can dive to a thousand feet and i think the females weigh about one ton and the males weigh about four tons these are females the small ones they're huge my wife took these pictures uh with her camera and um uh, king penguins by the thousands, maybe 10,000. And some are molting. Some are right up close. And they're sort of uh, reprising their mating behavior. It's the end of the mating season, but might as well keep doing it. Then they mold, and then they go to sea for six more months and come back. Everybody's trying to take pictures of the penguins, different kind. So I thought, it, and everybody is like stuck there for a while. There's nothing else to do except look at each other. The penguins can't go swimming. The seals are there. They're not ready to swim yet. Uh, so I thought it was like the big red penguins are looking at the big black penguins. Never, so we had the contest to take the most creative penguin picture. So everyone's trying to take even more um, creative photos, like lie down on the ground or scoot over, get as low as you can. Most people had the lens that was too long to take the right pictures. If, if you sit down, maybe the penguins will come right up to you. We get a different angle. This guy has a GoPro on a little tripod. Sometimes they'll even climb on you. 
Well, it's our last place to go is the peninsula of Antarctica. Most of Antarctica is completely covered with ice all the time. This part is only mostly covered with ice. So this is 500 miles farther north than the main part of Antarctica. So we made a big triangle. It's over here. Went to several different islands. And one day we could actually stand on the mainland of Antarctica up here. It's a little bit like going to Key West in Miami and saying that it's good for all of covers North America. So we got our group photo on the front of the boat. There's a big glacier. And uh, well, Shackleton's crew spent the winter on the beach right over here. It's amazing. So you, would, you wouldn't probably volunteer to spend the winter there. So these are another kind of penguin. This is the fifth kind of penguin we saw. These are chin straps. They have a little black line under their chin. It looks like, you know, uh, uh, the strap on a football helmet or something. This bird's called a sheath bill. It makes its living eating penguin poop. So everybody's got a different role in the food chain down there. So chin strap penguins. And they only nest pretty far south, close to Antarctica. They're molting. So there's no vegetation when you get down there. Uh, anyway, we're taking selfies with the phones and the long telephotos and enjoying it. It looks like there's snow, but there's all feathers that they're molting. Uh, this is a big predator bird called a giant petrel. There's many kinds of petrels from small to large, but this is a giant petrel. That's sort of like a turkey vulture. Uh, it'll sometimes catch young penguins and eat them and penguin eggs and uh, scavenge anything that's dead. This is a different kind of seal, the Weddell seal, really camouflaged. Just hanging out. So we went to another island called Deception Island. This is actually a volcano. So the ship's going into the center of a volcano. Uh, it has erupted within the last hundred years. So, the, so it's a hollow island. And the ship can go in the center. It's a black, sandy beach. And there's also... Uh, a ghost town. It was once a research station and a whaling station. These big tanks held diesel oil because when you're that far from civilization, you need a lot of fuel to keep, keep the ships running. These are Antarctic fur seals. They have really long whiskers. These are males uh, on this island and um, their breeding season is over. They mostly hang out and sleep and fight some more. Uh, there's a penguin colony on this island. This is Coverville Island. So penguins pick the very best places to have their nests that have the most dry land for the longest time. We motored around here. There were humpback whales around. There were a couple kinds of seals, all different kinds of seabirds. These are Gentoo penguins. This is the largest colony of Gentoo penguins, and this is just one part of this colony. These are about knee-high penguins, pretty small, but they're very colorful and very animated. They chase each other around. Um, so this one's a baby. So the adult is teaching it to fend for itself by leading it on a merry chase. Chase it around for a while, then it gets fed. Then it learns to swim. There's Susan. The penguins that come right up to us sometimes. These are uh, baby penguin getting fed. This one that came right up and pecked on my leg. They're pretty curious is uh, going after this lady's other camera strap. 
Sometimes they climb on you if you let them. Well, when they're on the water, they uh, swim underwater, swim on the surface. They porpoise like dolphins do. I wasn't expecting that. So the kayakers were out going. So these are icebergs, of course. And the kayakers were going back and forth between the uh, icebergs. Uh, the ship goes through some narrow passages where there's rocks and ice. Keep in mind, this is the warm season. This is as warm as it ever gets there. Um, I don't think we ever saw above 40 degrees. We visited a research station that Argentina has. They were not in residence today, but uh, so we could lay in there, walk around. So Argent, uh, Argentina research station. Went there. That's it. That's the whole thing. We climbed up on the hill. Uh, the snowpack was too slippery to go on the snow very well, but uh, we climbed up on his cliff and looked down and watched the whales and the seals and the penguins, the uh, cormorants. These are Gentoo penguins right in the little village there. They poop everywhere. All these stripes are poop. That's a lot of poop, and it doesn't go away very fast. Because it's always cold. These are two humpback whales that uh, swam right along next to the kayakers. So on the last day, or the next to last day, they had a free swim. You could swim. Uh, the water's 30 degrees. So, so we could see they had three safety boats. They tied you on. Um, People ready to jump in if they have to rescue you. I didn't do it. Susan said she was going to do it, but I did not do it, and she didn't do it either. It was 30 degrees. Of people went in for a second or two. Then we had a barbecue up on the deck. It was great. Beautiful sunset. Uh, these are Gen 2 penguins swimming along. This Sometimes swim in flocks. Pretty cool to see. Sometimes they'd be swimming and diving all around us. This was our very last day in Antarctica. Uh, we went to two different bays where the water was calm. There's killer whales we saw, orcas. Oh, you see on the, there's nowhere to land. All oh, It's all ice. There's a crab eater seal. If you sleep, you sleep on the ice. There's a humpback whale tail. If you photograph the other side, you, sometimes you can identify individual humpback whales. I could never get a good picture of the bottom side, but it's cool to see them. There were some that were very close to us. They're big icebergs. This is bigger than our ship, and they're close to us too. Getting close to the end. In the last hour that we were down there, this one humpback whale came right up to our ship and messed around with us for an hour. It was literally right next to our ship, looking straight down on it. It went under the ship. It went around the ship. Um, Mike was on the Zodiac, waiting for his turn to get the Zodiac on board. Well, went right by him. I didn't take that picture. That was great. This is our last uh, picture on the back of the boat. This is the be most beautiful day. It's not, not exactly cold. Um, it's clear and not much wind. It was the best day. We stay an extra hour to watch the whale going around the ship. And I think that's the last slide. Let's see. Are you still there? I haven't been able to see you. I'm gonna close, uh, close the PowerPoint. Here I am. Does anybody got any questions? I can see there's a couple of questions. So it's, uh, one question, is climate change affecting Antarctica?
It is. Uh, ice is melting. Ice along the Antarctic Peninsula is melting quite a bit. Uh, you would never say it's warm there, but uh, it has gotten warmer. And some places the ice shelves have broken off and that will raise the sea level for the rest of the world. Uh, big, I'm talking big pieces of ice, size of a county of Colorado. Um, do human visitors interfere with the penguin nesting for seal breeding sites? So they have a, a lot of rules. They are very well organized. I thought they did a great job. Um, all the ships are in an organization. It's called, I can't remember what it's called, uh, IAATC. It's an organization of all the ships that take tours down there, and they have rules. Only one ship can go to each place each day. Only 100 people can get off the ship at the same time. They can't get closer than uh, 15 feet to penguins, but they're really they're totally avoiding going near the main part of any of the colonies. Let's see. What else? Penguins. Um, there's a whole food chain. But not it all comes from the ocean and none of it from the land. There's no insects, there's no seeds, there's no plants for birds or animals to eat. So they eat uh, plankton out of the ocean, larger sh shrimp called krill, and then smaller fish and then larger fish and squid. And then there's the penguins and the albatross that are getting the... Um, fish out of the ocean. There are other birds that can eat the penguin eggs or the penguin chicks. There are skuas, which is a, a big kind of seagull. There are the giant petrels, very large size of the petrels. Um, on South Georgia, there were rats. There was a large colony of rats. And they spent millions of dollars eliminating the rats. And the rats had a really big effect on the nesting birds, and they removed the rats. So that was great. Uh, and the nesting birds are coming back to some areas where they had not been for a number of years. Any other good questions? I can't see you. Type a question. I think that might be all of the questions for this evening. I don't see any more either, Bruce, but thank you so much for um, taking us on that whole voyage. It was really, really spectacular. So thank you. Well, thank you, Megan, for inviting me. Um, it was a great cruise. <laughs> uh, you can go on a shorter cruise from South America to Antarctica and go in a week. Um, we paid extra to go on a longer cruise. It goes farther and, and sees even more stuff. That's yeah, a great, cool great that. place to visit. Uh, yeah. I don't think any of these cruises are going now, but I hope they will be yeah. uh, going again by uh, our next winter, our time. <laughs> yeah. November, yeah. December, January. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us. And uh, we'll hope to see you again soon. Okay, thank you, Megan. All right, bye. Bye.